Well, Ken, we're probably facing one of the biggest challenges of biblical interpretation that there is. Yeah, you get the commentators and they, they all have their own little take on it. Yeah, <clears throat> but I think we're relatively safe if we, instead of trying to pinpoint every detail, to see the meta-narrative, to see the bigger picture. And the way that evil has trans worked its way through history. Yes. And perhaps also to go back, because this really is the continuation of last week's um, Bible study. Last week we were in chapter 10, where Daniel had a vision. It, it was of a great conflict, and we're not told anything about what he actually saw, except that it made him sick for three weeks. Yeah. And now the angel comes and says, well, you know, th this is what it all meant. So whatever it was he saw, now we know what it meant. Yeah. I think we also need to keep in mind that Daniel, and it's true of other prophetic uh, uh, places, Daniel moves repetitively through mm -hmm. history. It starts off simply, but then expands each reiteration or reformatting the prophetic scene includes expansion of the understanding necessary. And, and particularly expansion of the part at the end. Yes. Like back in chapter 2, a lot more detail was given to the legs and toes than yeah. was to the head of gold. And that's a good point, Ken, because the fact that the greater and more significant emphasis is on the latter part of the mm -hmm. prophetic picture uh, helps us understand that some of the characters, some of the interplay in the early parts is not as significant mm -hmm. as the latter and yeah. must be interpreted in the light of what the latter reveals. And it's also being written for people down through the ages, particularly for the end time. And so if it's really specific, then people don't recognise that it's having application in their day and age and the experience that they're going through. Yeah. Like when Jesus gave the picture of so-called end times, mm -hmm. part of that picture was applicable to the, almost the immediate circumstance of the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Mm -hmm. But the bigger emphasis was clearly not on that. It was the real end, the, the latter part of history. And, and it's interesting, <coughs> Jesus is drawing, particularly on this chapter. You know, when Jesus said, do we war, you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. Yes. That's exactly what this chapter is about. Yep. This army coming through, this, and he said, it's okay, it's not the end, but be aware it's going to happen. Yeah, and you know what I think is significant, that Jesus in Matthew says, when you see this abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, mm -hmm. let the reader understand. So clearly, whatever is being uh, enunciated here, is mm -hmm. understandable, not necessarily to the people at Daniel's time, but definitely to the people of the end. But it was certainly understandable to the people between the time of Daniel and the time of Christ, for example. Yes. They would have understood the bottom layer of a multi-layered picture. Mm -hmm. And there, there would be parallels it would be like getting the skeleton of a story and the people at the end are getting the fleshed out story. But they were getting some specific stuff. Like as we move into the beginning of the chapter, he said, look, there's going to be three more kings in Persia. You know, that, that's pretty specific. Yes. Um, and, you know, the Persians impacted on the people of God. They impacted on the city of Jerusalem. And I think that's a key point because no prophecy includes characters or nations that are not 
di directly impacting on God's people. Mm -hmm. So if you read something that sounds remotely like some nation doing something somewhere, if they did not, if they did not impact on God's people, that's not what that story yeah, is about. There's a good chance in that case your interpretation's a little bit wayward. Exactly. It's, it's God's providing this for hope and comfort to people mm -hmm. who will suffer. It, it's interesting, Rain, that straight after that it says, look, he's going to rise up against the kingdom of Greece. And again, that's pretty specific. You know, the Persian is going to go against the Greeks. Um, but he's not going to succeed with that one. In fact, we've got a mighty king who's going to do what he wants to. Then his kingdom's going to be broken and split towards the fore. And suddenly we say, hey, hang on, we, we've struck this before in the, in the chapter, haven't we? One, one um, thing that emerges from the opening verses of chapter 11, and you've rightly identified the fact that it is a local context situation mm -hmm. at that point in history. Um, characters emerge. There are some that are alluded to, but almost dismissed. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not uh, of consequence. They're just filling out the picture. But it soon becomes evident as you look through chapter 11 that the king of the south and the king of the north feature heavily. Now, whether the feature is intended to restrict it to some historical context then, or whether it's simply a microcosm of the bigger battle that the whole of Daniel alludes to. And I guess the question we would ask, if it's the king of the north or the king of the south, north of where and south of where? Yeah. Well, within the historical setting, north would be north of Jerusalem mm -hmm. and south would be south of Jerusalem. And uh, we have several characters that fit into those pictures, mm -hmm. especially in the north. Yep. You've got Syria and also Babylon. Yep. When you go south, it's <coughs> primarily Egypt. Egypt. And so within that initial context, the people would identify w w with what was going on, yeah. the battles between those and how they were impacted by it. So when Nebuchadnezzar came and destroyed Jerusalem, he came down from the north. Yeah. Isn't it interesting that, and I think we looked at it last week, chapter 1 begins in the opening verses about vessels from the temple mm -hmm. being effectively desecrated in in uh, Babylon. And then you have other desecrations and progressively they become more complex mm -hmm. and more cosmic in a sense because the descriptions in these latter portions are dramatic. And they're broader than just a local geographic setting. Exactly. There are issues that incorporate the nations around um, like it's a global, it's coming to a global climax. If you think of the rest of scripture, look at the interaction Israel had with the king of the south. Mm -hmm. They had their captivity or their slavery for centuries in, in um, Egypt. And Pharaoh was pretty reluctant to let them go. Yes, and it involved a conflict over worship. Mm -hmm. The Babylonian... And, the, and, God actually had to step in with a mighty hand and get them out of there over the king of Egypt's protestations. It's interesting, when Israel was delivered from Egypt, the waters of the Red Sea were parted, mm -hmm. dry land. In the case of Babylon, in the later centuries, the waters were parted, the river was dried, to make way for the, the people who came to eventually liberate Israel, the Medes and the Persians. Mm -hmm. 
So the, these parallels or the micro pictures are very useful in seeing what the bigger picture is about. Yeah. So we, we come to a period where the, the Greeks are there and they are going backwards and forwards and right in the middle of it you know, are God's people. And we say, well, you know, that just doesn't sound right, that all the stuff's happening around and they're going, going through it along with everybody else. Well, it's almost like everybody's going over top of them. Um, one of the other things that I think helps us with this panorama of prophetic uh, uh, vision is the fact that all through th these battles, which impact in a roundabout way the children of God, are part of the dilemma that chapter 9 reveals for us in Daniel's prayer. Daniel is praying for the sins of his people and the consequences of those sins, the struggles that they have had as a result of, you know, what... Uh, they have foolishly chosen to do. Um, when you see here the um, king of the south and the king of the north waging battle, it's not in isolation from consequence mm -hmm. on the children of, of God. And there, there was a major conflict. You know, the whole Maccabean revolt and the rise of the Pharisees, just grew out of the Syrians coming in and saying, well, we're going to put our, our statue in your temple, we're going to sacrifice a pig on your altar. Um, and, and these words would have been a lot of encouragement to the people yeah. going through that. Even though Belshazzar's feast is minor compared to what mm -hmm. happened uh, with um, Antiochus Epiphanes when he did the the sacrifice of pigs on the altar. Um, the, the fact that God's truth represented by these uh, vessels in the uh, temple, that was a, an abomination, a violation, mm -hmm. a horrendous thing for the children of God. Their sensitivity to that, unfortunately, had been blunted by years of, well, doing their own thing and getting into trouble, but they had sufficient mind to realise that this, this was truly a bad thing. He does in verse 14, he talks about the violent ones among your own people. So, you know, sometimes the people of God don't act in the way that is is really going to help their cause. But eventually they, they gave up, I guess, fighting and, and asked another northern neighbour to come and help them. Yeah, it's interesting over the centuries, the alliances that were formed, mm -hmm. um, none of which ended up in the favour of, of Israel. In, in fact, in verse 20, you know, then there shall arise in his place one who shall send an exactor of tribute or taxes. Um, you ask a foreign power to come and be present and to help you, and, and you can expect that they are going to exact their, their share. And it's at this point we say, well, look, here's another place we can put a pin in, and this looks very much like where the New Testament story is cutting into it. It's, it's terrible when you think of it. They invited someone for lunch and they liked it so much they took over the household. Mm -hmm. And so Rome became present in the Holy Land. Yeah. It's interesting uh, for those who <clears throat> think that this Syrian uh, megalomaniac um, will constitute the whole of that prophetic picture. Um, Rome, a short while after Antiochus Epiphanes had asserted himself in that ugly way, Rome put its foot down and said, 
you come to heal, you do as we tell you. And so the imagery that it applied to Antiochus Epiphanes now flows on to a much broader scenario, Mm -hmm. including Rome. And we mustn't forget that often in Bible prophecy, uh, uh, what seems like an individual character is representative of a kingdom, not just the individual, as was in the case of Rome. What we begin to notice, though, is at this point, something happens that's repeated over and over. Um, In verse 20, he shall come without warning and obtain the kingdom by flattery. You know, when the Greeks took over from the Persians, it, it was conquest by force. When the Greeks fought among themselves, you know, the Seleucids and the Ptolemies, the, the Syrians and the Egypt, um, it was military. But this is, is different. He's coming with flattery. In verse 23, he shall act deceitfully. Just like in chapter 8, which Daniel was deeply concerned about, Mm -hmm. this character in that setting, he will cause deceit to prosper and he will consider himself superior. When they feel secure, he will destroy many and take his stand against the prince of princes. Mm -hmm. Now, the type of description that you referred to is similar to that Mm -hmm. because there is a pattern. The ultimate battle involves deception, flattery for that purpose and a whole lot of other nasty things, not necessarily military force. And the battle is not so much to conquer land anymore as to conquer the mind. Yep. It's the battle for the human mind for human loyalty, and it's there in in verse 21, it's there in verse 23, he shall act deceitfully, become strong with a small people. Um, In verse 27, they'll just tell lies to each other at the same time, at the same table. Verse 32, he will seduce with flattery. Verse 34, um, many will join themselves with flattery. One of the things, Ken, that I noticed also was the, the fact that their issue was against the Holy Covenant. It's mm-hmm. repeated a couple of times. The fact is that this now transcends normal political or military disputes. This mm-hmm. is of a higher dimension. So from the time, and I'm going back to verse 22, um, armies are swept away and broken, even the Prince of the Covenant. Now, we've come across this again before this. The Prince. He will make a covenant with many for one week. In the midst of the week, he'll be um, cut off. Here is the Prince of the Covenant being broken. And we say, well, look, you know, we, we can put a pen in here and say, here we are at the time of Christ. Once we go beyond here, we're getting into not the Israel era, but we're starting to move into the Christian church, which goes global. Mm. And, and so the prophecy actually gets a little bit more fuzzy, talking in principles rather than detail. Ken, I read uh, one scholar who likes to view God's people, both Old Testament and New Testament, as one, mm-hmm. that the dichotomy of Israel and the church really should not be there. And when you think of it, uh, whatever was enacted that Israel experienced is to a degree the same for God's people. Perhaps the context will be different. Perhaps the expression of hatred towards them will take a different form, but it's the same in essence. And each also has the problem with stumbling. And that's a theme that is picked up just a little bit further down 
in the chapter around about verse 32. Yeah. Um, when, when in 31 it speaks of um, they will set up the abomination that causes desolation, many interpreters have said, well, that's what Antiochus did when he polluted the sanctuary with dead pigs and whatever. But Jesus himself alludes to this and mm -hmm. says, when you see this, so it hadn't transpired in its fullest sense when Jesus spoke, it, it was, was still, still future. future. So it is clearly taking us to bigger things than just the limited history of mm -hmm. the Persians and the Syrians and the Roman Empire. But it's also giving us a little more clarity on Daniel 8. Um, chapter 9, we had the rebuilding of the city and the sanctuary. But chapter 8 had talked about it being destroyed. A and here we have a power much further down, again, profaning the temple, taking away the daily, and we've talked about the daily before. It's, I know a lot of translations put it as the, the burnt, regular burnt offering, but that's a supplied expression. Yeah. It, it's simply the whole service of the sanctuary that pointed to the ministry of Jesus. Yeah. And that's where I think the, the dramatic impact of this chapter uh, emerges because what we are seeing, especially in the latter part of chapter 11, is a emphasis on the sanctuary in terms of what it meant, mm -hmm. not in terms of its rituals, although the rituals alluded to something in the grander picture of, of the gospel, but clearly these are awesome, redemptive, cosmic things. And, and the, the core of it is Jerusalem. The core of Jerusalem is the temple. The core of the temple is the ministry of Jesus. Yes. And clearly. so the whole attack really seems to be on the ministry of Jesus yeah. and his people. You know, even in verse 37, they will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the one desired by women. Mm -hmm. Now, in Jewish thought, um, the one desired by women was the Messiah. Mm -hmm. All of them wanted to be connected with, with his emergence. So here we have a clear reference to the central character of, of this prophetic uh, panorama. Mm -hmm. And still in verse 37, it talks about, for he shall magnify himself above all. And as I look at, at that passage, that gives me echoes back to chapter 7, where the little horn grows big, magnifies himself, exalts himself, speaks straight words. In chapter 8, again, the little horn magnifies himself. Um, so the, there's a real parallel there. Yeah. It's but interesting. Remember we said earlier that the opening ch chapters, the opening mm -hmm. prophetic pictures were not heavy on detail. Mm -hmm. But within what is available there are clear echoes of the bigger problem that emerges in these chapters. For example, um, when Nebuchadnezzar asked them to bow to the statue on mm -hmm. the, the plain of Jura, that was a blasphemous thing. So, and, and in the case of Belshazzar's feast, what he did with the sacred vessels was a blasphemous thing. It was a vile thing. So all mm. through it. And with this one, he shall magnify himself. What about chapter 4? Where Nebuchadnezzar comes to the point where he says, is this not great Babylon that I have built? You know, for my glory, by, by my majesty, it's all about he shall magnify himself above all. And when he did that, the very next thing that happened was <laughs> to crash. Yes. Well, it's coming. It's not quite yet. 
But we've skipped over 32 to 35, which are probably pretty important because they're talking about the experience of God's people in the midst of all this going and backwards and forwards of the, the different armies that are around. Yes, uh, it says the people who know their God will firmly resist him. That's the latter part of verse um, mm-hmm. 32. But uh, the first part of verse 32, he shall seduce with flattery those who, and I'm assuming, who end up violating the, the covenant. Yes. Seduce. You know, just think about what's implied in that word seduce. It's got the sense of to make it attractive. Yeah. You know the words of Jesus in Matthew 24, perhaps the most prominent element of what Jesus has to say in Matthew 24 is do not be deceived. And the nature of what they're confronting is by what Jesus says next, for many will come in my name. That has the potential for a seduction because the people imagine that what they're being confronted with has a form of godliness. It's not Jesus, but something purporting to be him. And I wonder if Jesus was actually drawing on this chapter when he he said, don't let anyone deceive you. Yeah. Because that seems to be a a key strategy that's happening through here. It happened, it's not problems that are coming from outside. Suddenly this is a problem on the inside. Yep. Wolves in sheep's clothing. If you look at 725, he'll think to change set times and laws and what, what he's... Uh, aspiring to do is to take the prerogatives of God and claim them for himself which is part of the process of deception you know putting them into a frame of mind where they will be confused Mm -hmm. and yield to something which normally with reason they would reject Um, So, so there we saw that he also spoke great words against the Most High. There's that exalting, wear out the saints of the Most High. Um, think he can change it. A- and it's going to be allowed to happen for a time and times. So it's not just a, a short thing. It's going to be an ongoing problem. And what we are seeing in the picture is an emerging intensity moving from just simple cause for alarm to a crescendo of concern at the end Mm -hmm. when it is of such a nature that Jesus said that if it were possible, even the elect would be deceived. And I think we have the elect here, the people who know their God. There in verse 32. Yes. We'll we'll stand firm and, and we'll take action. So... Not everybody, you know, just because it's a general problem, not everybody's going to succumb. In fact, verse 33, you know, the wise among the people shall make many understand. Yes. There's a a very active thing happening among the people of God with, you know, all this other stuff happening. They are still there being the people of God. They are understanding, though... And that's a, probably a key word because it says, even while they're understanding and acting, there's still stuff going on. For some days they shall stumble by sword and flame, by captivity and plunder. It's not necessarily going to be an easy thing to be the people of God. Yeah. Um, it's but it's going to be the, the right thing. You know, the, there's echoes there, back to the fiery furnace. I think uh, when we come to chapter 12 next week, <clears throat> the interesting thing is in verse 2 it says, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Then verse 3, those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. 
what God's concern is in the midst of this dramatic cosmic conflict mm -hmm. that people are extracted from it, saved from it, and those who have surrendered themselves to him will lead many to righteousness because they will be proclaiming the good news that is the very thing that the enemy is trying to smash. 